Welcome to the CISA um, digital conference. Um, this is our first um, digital conference, uh, which is so exciting. We have people from the whole world, not just Australia this time. So it's great. So we have everyone on board. So thank you for attending this conference. Um, and today's topic, we're going to address um, entrepreneurial and innovative, innovative thinking. So I think under this time, so most people they are unemployed. I think now is a good time to start something you like and uh, follow your dreams. Now it's a great chance. If you start at home, now you have more time to practice your idea with the people, uh, interact with people online. So I, know, I think now, okay, let's get started. First of all, I would like to introduce myself as moderator. So I'm the National Undergraduate Officer from CESA. CESA is the Council of International Students Australia. So we long be with the government and the higher education sector to advocate international student educa international education. And we support all international students across the whole Australia. Like, uh, like this COVID-19, we had um COVID uh, campaign. Um, so we launched the welfare package to support all the international students in Australia. So I think do follow our um, page and the uh, LinkedIn page so you know more about what is CISA about. And, uh, and then let's introduce our speakers. Um, so Sam, um, would you like to go first? Then Shana, you go second, then team third. So just briefly introduce yourself. Oh, you're on mute. Hey everyone, um, welcome. Um, it's really exciting. Um, I'd like to just first off acknowledge the traditional elders, the lands that I'm on, um, on the colonized lands of the Woiwurrung people and acknowledge the elders past, present uh, and emerging wherever you are. Um, also, I'd like to say hello and my name is Sam Shlansky. Um, so on the slide, you can see a little bit about me, but basically I'm an award-winning American-born Indonesian speaker. Mm -hmm. I've also designed and delivered close to somewhere between 700 to 1,000 plus um, sessions in person online after a point it just blurs together over 10 years. Um, I've done that in urban and rural Australia, Indonesia, Thailand, basically all across Asia. Um, beyond that, that, that's sort of why I ended up becoming the CEO of Marco Polo Project. Um, about a year and a half ago, we forgot to celebrate a year because it's been a, a wild year. Um, but simply as a CEO, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to grow our community and really um, start to work on some major challenges facing international students. Um, across Australia um, and more broadly, um, you know, across the education sector. So that's me, Marco Polo Project. Thank you, Sam. Shana? Hello, everybody, and welcome. I also am sitting on the lands of the Woiwurrung um, people from the Kulin Nation, and I pay their res respects to their elders past and present, and those emerging, and any who may be with us today. Um, it's very exciting to be here with you. My background uh, is broad. I was uh, raised in uh, business and went on to start a number of them myself and have worked with young people to mentor and coach them to greatness in their own entrepreneurial ventures. I'm now running a project for the international student community where we bring students and startups together across Victoria. And uh, you can see in the background, it's called the Glow Project. So I'm very proud to be a co-founder co of Start Global who delivers the Glow Project and a director of that. And welcome today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Shana. Team. Uh, thank you. I'll briefly uh, acknowledge uh, the country on which we stand as well. Uh, my name is Tim Carroll. I'm originally a medical scientist from Australia, but further north from here. Um, I led a fortunate life where I uh, spent most of my career working for a large biopharmaceutical company and travelled extensively and worked all over the world, lived and worked in every Asian market for a number of years um, and for a short period of time headed up the Australia Trade and Investment Commission, which is the Australian government organisation tasked with helping Australian companies export. Um, since then, Sharon and I founded uh, Stuck Global and the Globe Project and I work in a range of areas, in, including technology uh, and uh, really working with international students and helping them connect to each other, to domestic students, but also with business. So 
Um, we're very keen on improving employability and entrepreneurial skills in our international student community. Thanks, Jun Yi. Thank you, team. Um, I think personally, um, I have to say all the speakers here, I made them all, they are very good mentor, uh, mentor for all the international students. So uh, not, they will navigate. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, so if you want to have a new idea, we want to share with them, feel free to go. So I think, um, I think that everyone, all the speakers here, they have a different experience before. So that, um, so that's why we'll move to the first question. So how to build an environment that stimulates the innovative thinking? So I think, um, Sam, would you like to go first? Oh man, I'm going to be on the spot all the time. Um, <laughs> I think what comes to mind is just simple. It's connect with curiosity, but also purpose. That's how you build, you know, your personal environment. Because you can't just rely on other people to build it for you. Mm. And you do need to kind of go out there and take and create opportunities. So what I mean by that is, like, you need to really take the time to actually, you know, whatever time you got is time to learn, is time to connect. Um, and doing it with curiosity, and I mean curiosity with respect, like in an egalitarian sort of same-same um, sort of way. Um, but the other thing is, is don't just use the time you have and use other people's time. Do it with a bit of purpose, a bit of intention, um, and you'll be able to really sort of stimulate environments that'll get you thinking differently. Because with diversity, any adversity can be really overcome. And that means diversity beyond like nations and races. And that means diversity in industry. I mean, we've got a range of industries just even amongst us. Um, or, uh, you know, getting thinking from just different places, um, different stages, different parts, because people often forget time is a factor. So you might not be where someone you're speaking to is at yet. Get that growth mindset and you'll be able to connect with curiosity, with purpose, um, and just to keep motivating yourself to do it. Because as long as you're learning, even if you feel like it, it wasn't a great conversation, now I talk about this like in my online course, um, even if it's not a great conversation, as long as you've learned something, it's been a great conversation. Um, so yeah, that's how I would start to answer that question. Connect with curiosity and purpose. Thanks, Sam. So Shana, would you like to share some of your ideas? Sure. Um, I think when we're, we're trying to set up an environment that stimulates innovative thinking, you have to create a safe space where all of your ideas are valued. I think that um, in, in our particular times, as we've seen, um, it's, there's, there's no, no place for creative constraint. And so everything is open for discussion. We have to make sure that everybody's uh, ideas and thoughts are valued in a culturally appropriate way and learn from in, learning from each other during that time. Um, which leads me on to the next really important point, which is diversity of thinking. We really, each of us have to be responsible for getting out of our own cultural thought bubble and um, also bring some of those ideas into others' cultural thought bubbles. So um, that's where um, our international student community particularly is, is so wonderful to work with and across because the diversity of ideas that they bring and they're very valuable to business and um, are, are, are highly sought after. So I think it's um, making sure that that environment where you have those diverse ideas are um, in a place where everybody feels secure about bringing who they are and, and what they bring into that room. And, and finally, I think the most important thing is support and collaboration. So, you know, it's leading on from a lot of what Sam has said around the use of time and, and connecting with, um, with others. It's really understanding how when we bring people together, uh, we can celebrate success and thinking about all of the places that you can go to, but how they can come together to, to build greater gains for and outcomes. Thank you, Sean. I was so inspired. So, the team, would you like to share some of your ideas? Sure. Thanks, Juni. Um, I'm going to approach this from a different angle. I'm going to be very personal mm -hmm. to the students and welcome to you all. Um, if, if you're not aware, entrepreneurship uh, is an old French word and the main part that has stuck with us over the years of its uh, evolution is that entrepreneurship involves taking risks. 
Um, it used to be taking risks with your own finances and investing in something that may or may not work. Um, nowadays, is a little bit more of investing other people's finances and what you're doing. But the main way of creating an environment to foster entrepreneurship is your own personal mindset and being prepared to have a plan and explore what you want to do. Uh, and I think in the modern world, to keep it very simple, there's two pathways you can take. You can be an entrepreneur and work for somebody who lets you be creative, as Sam and as Shona have pointed out, um, where you can come up with new ideas and better solutions and observe problems and then find ways of fixing them. Or you can take the other pathway, which is not be employed by somebody, but to employ yourself. And to be entrepreneurial in creating a business, which might be Uber, it might be uh, Amazon Web Services, it could be something disruptive, or it could be something of a social enterprise. Um, so it really is all about your thinking and being prepared to take risks around what you're prepared to do with your learning, your experience and your career and expand your mind and, and look for solutions to problems. Thank you, Sam. I think, I think for me, so I, I'm going to make a conclusion for this question. I think all the speakers mentioned, I think, um, diversity. And uh, I think also I like uh, what Tim said. I got to approach this question from a different angle. That makes you be an entrepreneur. So you think differently from outside of the box. So you think differently, like I think some of the idea people already think. So you jump out from the box. So I think also I have to say under this time, I um, have new ideas good. So environment for me is a, a healthy environment because under this time, every time they get their mental health, so build a healthy environment for yourself. So if you um, didn't have a good sleep, so if you sleep it or if you inhibited it, so it can severely limit their ability to think and uh, to think um, flexibly. So I think that's make you, that's a good environment to stimulate innovative thinking. Also, I think um, diversity is an environment. Then I think um, diversity creates curiosity because uh, I think you meet people from different countries. I'm sure Shana, Tim, and Sam meet so much international students. I think all the international students, sometimes when they're interacting, so bring them a new idea sometimes, I'm sure. So I think when you meet more people, so more, more, meet more people, so that builds an environment to stimulate your um, innovative thinking. So I think this is a great question. I really love this question. I think there's so many other two questions coming up. So I think we're going to move to this um, second question. So I think there's a, um, as we said, as like how to build an environment now. So we got an environment now. Now is so what advice would you give to the young people to help them to be more entrepreneurial and innovative in their future? So um, Sam, would you like to go first again? I might be a gentleman and hand it to a lady first. Um, do you want to go, Shona? Sure, I'm happy yeah, to get started yeah. on that one. <laughs> community. Yeah, great. Um, well, there's a couple of things here. Um, the first one is have a look at some of the great stories about some of the migrant entrepreneurs in Australia. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be told. Um, Ames has some great, they have, a, and I can post this website in the chat feed, some great stories about Australian made on their website um, because they're, they're really uh, the backbone of a lot of the businesses that are well established. I think that it's a really difficult time. Many people are looking at it right now and thinking, oh, it's a recession, there's unemployment, it's really difficult. Um, what, is that, what does that mean for us? You know, what, what can we do in terms of um, becoming more entrepreneurial and innovative? So I think we need to take a step back and think about who you are and where you might come from and how you have global skills, uh, you understand offshore markets. Um, market sensitivities, economics, governance and political structures, language and culture, the list goes on and on. And I think it's a real time where Australian businesses are beginning to prepare for potential offshore expansion and learn about the barriers uh, for them. Um, so these are many transferable skills that you have and it's a really opportune time to reach out to some of these businesses and start your entrepreneurial journey by reaching out and, and connecting with some of these businesses. 
in this time, there are many, many examples of businesses that started during recessions. And, you know, I can go through the boring list of American ones like, you know, Dropbox and Twilio and Uber and so on. Um, but let me share some really interesting points that probably important if you are looking at starting during this time. And I think you'll see an alignment with where you're at, particularly if you're an international student. And if you're not, you're a business that um, is having challenges during this time. Um, you must be fiscally prudent. So right now you have a massive constraint on your financial resources. Well, that's what it's like when you start your entrepreneurial journey. So right now we're in the environment which is really similar to what it is, is like to move towards that. Um, there's tons of talented people around at the moment that can support you. Many of them have time on their hands. Many of them have retired early. Some of them are looking for a change. Some of them might be unemployed. So there's a really good opportunity to tap into people for their knowledge and learn about what they did in their entrepreneurial journeys and even get some shared experience. Um, working in challenging environments can cause failure and you will learn a lot from that. So now is, is a time where you can give it a go. Um, and running a business right now will cost you less. So you'll have better powers to negotiate and uh, on most things that run your business. And when you come out of this really challenging time, there's probably likely going to be fewer competitors. So I really wanted to give some structure around um, how you might get started uh in your in your journey um to entrepreneurship and i can hand over to tim or, or sam thank you johnny thanks tim would you like to go uh absolutely i'll, uh, I'll let sam go last this time because he started first <laughs> um i guess i'll make three major points um about this so the first one is that there's actually a lot of academic information that you need to learn about entrepreneurship there's a lot of structure a lot of things that you need to know is shown a point to do about economics, uh, business models, uh, how to execute your idea. And Melbourne is a most excellent place to be when it comes to tapping into those resources. And I'm referring to a couple of questions from Manadeep and Carol as well um, in that space. Um, the other point about that is, so don't think that you can learn entrepreneurship. You have to experience it as well. So uh, the advice I'd give to young students is, um, hard to easy to say to get an internship in a startup company or an entrepreneurial organization harder to do but the way to start that is to volunteer into that space find somebody who's doing something that you're passionate about that you're interested in that's innovative and see if you can add value to the business don't just volunteer to make cups of tea volunteer to participate and without doing an ad for the globe project if you look at our methodology it's uh setting up a system where you learn entrepreneurship and experience entrepreneurship from a business, but they learn from you. They learn from your skills and your mindset and the fact that you're a vibrant international citizen. Um, the second point that I'd like to make is that one of the stumbling blocks that international students in particular, and Carol, whether you're young or whether you're old, it doesn't really matter, is culture. Um, and Sam works solidly in this space where um, many of the international students come from cultures that have something called power distance uh, rated very highly. Um, and if you're interested in that, uh, there's a Dutch social scientist called Geert Hofstetter, and he rates culture in six different dimensions. One of them is power distance. What I mean by that is if uh, Jun Yi is my boss, um, in the Australian culture, I can say, Jun Yi, this isn't working. We need to do it differently. And Jun Yi is probably likely to listen to me and say, okay, I want to listen to your ideas. In many cultures that many of the students come from, and I can't see you, but I bet you're nodding, you don't have that opportunity. You must respect authority. It's hierarchical. Um, and Australia rates about 36 in that ranking. Uh, I think China rates about 83. Countries like Malaysia, 100. You do not get to question authority. So what you have to do is navigate those cultural differences and um, learn how to have a conversation with somebody saying, I want to work with your organization. I want to participate, but I want to add value to your business. Please let's work out a way where I am not just very quiet. I do what I'm told and I do an internship that's stapling for three months. I actually want to learn from you, but I want you to learn from me and how do we navigate that? Um, so Globe Project is actually all about that. Um, and 
the uh, third piece I want to point to is it's a really good way of managing that if you build connections and take a very large hammer and break your own cultural bubble. So what I mean by that is connect with international students from other jurisdictions, but really importantly, connect to Australians. So while you're here, one of the best ways of understanding the Australian culture is to make friends with Australians. Now that's not necessarily easy, but it's something that you should put a lot of effort into and not speak your own language and share a house with other language speakers. Go and attend events where you have to break out of your own comfort zone, meet with other people and wherever possible, work with them, do projects with them. And you'll see uh, Junyi and you don't see uh, Mia, who's hiding in the background helping out, Mia Tran, thanks Mia, um, are two of those people that go out of their way to do that. That's my comment. Thank you, Sam. I think, I think it was team, sorry. Sam, would you like to share some of your ideas? I would. I'm always, everyone knows I love sharing my ideas. That's why I've been a facilitator for so long. Um, that's an awesome point. I love like what um, Shana and um, Tim have said, particularly, um, you know, there's this idea of find your safe space, but at the same time, don't stay in your safety zone. You know, we talk about three different zones, you know, your safety zone, your learning zone, and your discomfort zone. Um, and, you know, get comfortable creating my, my sort of advice, which is um, which is simply doing things from a person-centered way. Um, so what I mean is I would probably think about it like we talk about in conversations, you take a three eye, three eye approach, which is to inspect, investigate and ignite when you have a conversation. But you can also do that when you have a bit of a self dialogue over the process of you know, being a bit more entrepreneurial or to be a bit more innovative, to, to be willing to take a bit more risks or to be willing to try new things, which I think is what those words sort of mean. So what I mean is simply like inspecting and getting quite personal and thinking to yourself, like what are the challenges? Like why do I need to solve it? Um, who is, who else is solving the challenge? Like, you know, all these sort of questions, like when did the challenge start? What does, you know, the end point look like? All those really nice specific setting context kind of questions is what we talk about in inspecting. The next thing is about like investigating and trying lots of angles. Because I think that's a really important piece of advice is that like what I was saying before is constantly stay in your growth zone. Don't kind of go cool, learnt it, running back to safety, but continue to be a little bit uncomfortable and get better and better at being a little bit uncomfortable. And as Tim said, take risks. Um, you know, connect with purpose is another thing that I also before said, but I think the one that really needs to be said is this idea of don't fail fast, fail forward. Learn as you fail, because you're gonna fail. Let's be real. I've failed, I don't know how many times these guys are willing to share it, but we've all sort of had a failure, whether it's me in my second language and I get a call from SBS and I suddenly am stuck at a construction site and I'm trying to do an interview in my second language on a radio show and I'm hard of hearing so that gives me a bit of empathy with people trying to learn languages I learned languages very late in life English very late in life so you know learn and learn formally and informally keep it balanced I have a few degrees a few certificates um, and some of them like my I have a you know I'm a certified human center designer with the UN um, but at the same time, I'm also an experienced practitioner. So I've actually done it dozens of times. I've done it with, you know, a design for diversity program where we work with, you know, study Melbourne. I've done it with communities from in Indonesia. I've done it all over as much as I formally learned it through an incredible course with DSIL Global, who I'd check out for resources. Finally, get passionate. That's what igniting is all about. Get fired up because you're going to fail going to be hard you're going to be in your you're going to be in uncomfortable spaces and it might feel a little bit i don't know not safe but the original point of fire was to create community and create safety so create your fire get excited if this is the challenge that you need to solve if this is the community you want to be a part of get passionate fall in love with it like 
why do you love it? Put it on a post-it note. It's a great, really practical piece of advice. I, I'm not in my usual office, but I have post-it notes on my wall about why I love working with students. I have testimonials, not for marketing. It is useful, but also to remind me why the community needs what we, what we do. You know, testimonials about students who have gone from casual work as a tour guide to um, now working for VCCI, for Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Mm -hmm. So this will fire you up when things get tough and a bit lonely because we've all been through loneliness and if you're not fired up and passionate and connected, it's even harder to reconnect. So that would probably mm -hmm. be my advice without getting into a TED talk. Um, and can much. I just add to that, Sam? I think that's fantastic. And I just want to say that... Um, you know, it's, it's that whole elephant model, you know, how do you eat an elephant, you know, one, one bite at a time. And I think that, you know, lots of great questions are coming in around. <laughs> That's not, um, but I, I say reach out because all of us have stories to tell around failures and success. And I, I think that um, what really Sam is getting at so much is that every, people will always have a coffee with you, will always talk to you. And the more people that you talk to, um, it, it just is a flow on effect from everything. Yeah. It's, um, somebody's mentioned, starting to mention some of the nights. Um, we won't, we won't, um, <laughs> put that, say that out loud, but yeah, there's some great places to go. But as we always say, just show up. You just don't know. You might meet one person and you get some golden, um, bit of information from them, or you might not, cause you might be too scared to talk to anyone, but just show up. Yeah. That's great. Junyi, Junyi, would you mind if I throw in a little bit, a yes, little bit of no problem? Jump in. Super practical advice, particularly in response to some of the questions and Carol in particular, um, because I think, let me interpret your question, Carol, is how do I find my big idea? Uh, and I think that's a question I get asked all the time. And my advice is get a notebook and observe. Yep. Yes. Um, so the, the classic quote, and Shona knows this and she'll laugh because he uses it all the time, is Henry Ford once said, don't listen to what people want. Don't go and do the marketing thing where you have forums and say, what would make your life better? Um, his view on that was, well, if I'd have done that, I would have built a faster horse rather than building a car. So you can spend your life a little notebook and observe problems and issues and, and note down, well, ambulance drivers get attacked by drunk people. Um, some people have problems getting on a bus. Uh, other people, the transport at the moment under COVID lockdowns really problematic. And then sit down and think through them. How do I come up with a solution to these everyday problems that I can turn into a business? Um, if you don't record them, you'll forget them. Um, and you can share them with friends and work with people saying, can we work as a team to come up with a solution that is disruptive and better and unique and has a value proposition that I can turn into a business and become my startup entrepreneurial business? That's my advice. A notebook. And, and it's exactly what you say, Tim. It's why a lot of these things come out of diversity in times like this because you are so frustrated at not being able to do something because a you might not be able to afford it or b it doesn't exist you know so it's really really good point and i think if you looked in any of our um cars or pockets or briefcases yeah notebooks are like even the little ones i've probably got a hundred of them on my desk but yeah great yeah i think those practical tips mm. like that is a good thing is record your journey share your journey you know it's not like i i have made the mistake of just having i have at least 150 200 of, of little notebooks under my bed because i don't really know what to do with them <laughs> and then i kind of recently got told hey like what is actually in those notebooks and i started to share it and people were able to kind of add richness and depth to it and I've started, I mean, you can see on my LinkedIn, I put up monologues once in a while. That's just me regurgitating stuff that I've picked up over the weeks. And it's a way of learning. Like there's this thing called like the um, forgetting curve, a way of helping your retrieval. Because it's not about forgetting that's the problem. Forgetting is how we learn. Very strange, but very exciting. But if you want to really learn, you also got to keep working those neural pathways. Your brain is not a library where you can neatly get stuff out. It's much more like Christmas lights. That's why like in our activities, we do like really interactive stuff because it'll activate all the stuff in that, in the motion part of your brain. And it won't just activate all of the how to kick a ball memories, but it actually activates all of the memories that are related to that, the scent of grass, the, um, the feel of, of something hard. And suddenly that kicks off a whole new memory around the challenge of getting on a bus after you've played sport 
and suddenly you've got a whole new set of ideas. So like in our activities and workshops we do, we include drawing, we get people up and moving and dancing, you know? They're fun, engaging, but they're purposeful. And I keep coming back to that. So I think that is also worth doing is, you know, practically share, not just, I would totally agree, learn, record, and finally share and iterate. Thanks, Sam. Um Jenna, team. I think I, I, even I learned so much today. I think I like what team said, notebook. <laughs> I think for me, every day I go out. So if I something, if I say something, oh, maybe I can make that better. I can optimize it better. I write it down. So it might a new business idea. So I think, I think for me, creativity is not a talent, but a way of thinking. So everyone has that way of thinking. But you bring your notebook write it down and stop thinking and share it, share it to them. And I think the best way to demonstrate whether your idea will be succeed in your community, share with the people around you. People might give you some of the new idea from different angle. So it's, just, it's about sharing. I think because everyone had their experience and it will generate from different perspective to answer your question from different angles. So you get more idea. So it, then you can try one by one, like, Maybe that one failed, then the second one will be succeed. So I think, um, like 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 me, um, I think six seven years ago I I came to Australia, so I tried to get out of my comfort zone to doing something what I'm not comfortable ways. So then here I am. So I uh, in the beginning I was so afraid to talk with the local people, so I'm afraid to make mistakes. So then I just I think for me I just okay I'll just speak out. I just speak out, and they give me some feedback and they criticize. Um, my mistakes now I'll prove it better so I think that's how people grow I think that's how you be an entrepreneur so like you can see the Elon Musk so like back in 10 years ago he launched the rocket he failed so many times I think like this is he you succeed so I think try try again don't be scared to be fair I think like someone said in a chat box I think so um, so fear, fear uh, is the mother of succeed success so which is good point so i think we're gonna move to the, the final questions to the, our speakers so i think oh where did you get your idea or concept from a business as an entrepreneur even i think i think i think team made a good point just you bring your notebook every day when you, when you go out even you have your phone here so so when you if you have some idea just tap it down i think um you know i like uh a DJ music. I think one of the DJ producer, I think uh, he shared his idea. How did he get all this idea? Every day he go out. If he have some idea, he recorded, he recorded. So that's how you get some of the new business idea, I think for me. But um, T, would you like to share some of your ideas for this question? Um, sure. So, uh, you know, I think there's some theory around doing this, which is really important. So there's um, invention, there's the word I don't like ideation, there's acceptation um, and innovation. Um, and I strongly encourage people to go and look at that. Um, I spent most of my career working as an entrepreneur in a corporate environment, uh, developing products to solve global solutions. Um, and it was an interesting journey because when I joined the company, they were very, well, they're only Australian focused. Their job was to build things that Australia needed and nobody else cared about. And that company evolved into a global um, success. Um, and I'll speak about the GLOW project. GLOW project came about when we were having a discussion with Study Melbourne, um, Hi Study Melbourne, um, around how to help international students um, become better connected, improve their mental health and improve their employability, which is the three main issues I believe international students face. And I think the idea came about because of a, a joining of two problems. So one problem is how do we do these things and improve life for international students? The second problem is when I was young, the way of running a business was to start your business, make products for Australia, sell it in the domestic market. If it was successful, figure out how to export it. Um, you didn't learn about global markets. You didn't think about your branding for the world beforehand. And um, there's some recent studies show that that's actually the slow way to do it. So, the idea um, that we came across, we came up with for the GLOBE project was to say, international students are intelligent, sophisticated, wonderful, skilled people, 
with lots of knowledge and yet they come here and they pay money, sometimes lots of money to study. And that can be approached as a unidirectional exercise where students know nothing and we're a teaching institution and our job is to deliver knowledge to students and then they stay or go um, and that's it. And I think international students are a massively wasted resource. Why can't we use students for Australian businesses to learn about the world, to learn about the China market, Junyi, uh, Mai, to learn about the Vietnamese market, to test their product and say, does my branding work? Um, how do you buy these products in your market? Do you buy it at a pharmacy or do you buy it at a supermarket or how does it work? And we, the secret source about the Globe Project is that we have to make the businesses understand the value of working with international students as equal partners. Not as interns with a subordinate relationship, but the students are learning from you and experience is entrepreneurship, but you're learning from them about their markets. That's the secret to have that happen. So you can have permission to participate, to say, your product's terrible. Um, Vietnamese people would not buy that product. It needs to be different. The brand doesn't work. The color is terrible. Um, we buy these, the government buys these in our country. We don't buy them as consumers, which means your business needs to figure that out. So um, I guess uh, in that case, it was two problems and saying, well, can we use two problems to actually solve each other? Thanks, team. Um, that was so great. Um, Shanna? Yes, um, thank you, Tim. And I want to make it, uh, I want to take a different angle and say, you know, I've worked on a number of projects that I've developed myself and I'm developing one at the moment. And where they always come from is often a problem that exists for you personally. And sometimes why that works so well is because you're so passionate about fixing it. And often when you, um, when you are trying to get a pro project off the ground, you have to be so passionate because you may not have funding relatively, you know, re uh, readily available for you. So that you need to find some way to align your passion with what it is that you're developing. And so, so thinking about something that's really obvious to you and, and quite often uh, what we see with, with migrants is that, um, and international students that come from different cultures, um, they, often those entrepreneurial ideas come from two reasons. One is that they don't have access to what it is that they need here. And the other is that they see something that Australians that have lived here for a long time don't see. Um, the second part to this is that um, often you'll have a great idea, but you might be a person who thinks strategically, but doesn't need know how to do it physically. Um, and that's where, um, as, a, as an international student, for example, you can partner with somebody and become co-founders on a, on a huge um, uh, opportunity that will then grow because you will bring other things to that. So sometimes the idea might not be yours, or it, but it might be your best friends, but you might have IT skills or engineering skills and they might have some other skill or they may, may have just had the idea. Thanks, Shannon. Sam, would you like to share some of your ideas? Yeah. Hey, sorry. Um, awesome hearing about those, those initiatives um, and those efforts. Um, I was just having a look at some of the questions and I got a little bit like um, in the zone because um, they're just so fantastic. Um, and that's kind of a bit of where I, I sort of got started. So the fun fact that needs to be said is, well, it's Friday, so Friday fun facts. I didn't start my Coca-Cola project. Um, yeah, the thing that I did entrepreneurial, uh, that might be a bit of a, a, a taking a risk is that I jumped in with Marco Polo Project a couple of years ago, um, when I was a public servant and kind of hating it. It was another job that I was doing and it wasn't a career. Um, and I just, I, I know it sounds really light. I'm a 20 something year old, but I really did want to do something that was a little more meaningful. Um, I would bribe myself to get out of bed and go to work by saying I'm delivering democracy because I was working room and doing data entry for eight to 10 hours. Um, 
which wasn't delivering democracy really. And so I took a bit of a risk and I went from a relatively steady job um, where I was you know, very well and truly useful to um, jumping in two feet first to Marco Polo Project, which has been around since 2011, but it's evolved a lot over that time um, to really continue to find new ways to collectively gather um, you know, international students with local opportunities and local opportunities with you know, global individuals. Um, and so it was this sort of bubbly thing that I jumped in for. Um, and I was brought in because I, I, I have that success in, you know, six plus years with the Australian Asian Youth Association and with, you know, doing stuff in high school, developing charity systems in high school, running language exchanges, multilingual language exchanges and things like that. I had the, 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 the hard head fact skills and I had the heart to kind of get on with it when it's a bit tough. Um, and I did have, you know, the, at hand, I did have some, some of the things. So the concept came from Julian, but the concept for what Marco Polo Project is, it's really come from the communities we work with and the communities I've had the joy of being a part of and being able to work with and, and go, what are the actual challenges you have and how might, how, what do you need? And being able to kind of co-create, or as we like to say, co-design, um, and as Tim might hurl, hear me say, ideate um, with communities. Um, but we, we do that. And we- Say it again, Sam, that. please. <laughs> ideate, ideate. Um, apparently I shout in Australian, that's a fun fact. Um, so yeah, there's this, this, this thing where we, through our co-lab, which is like a social lab model, um, we're able to work with you guys to turn your ideas and challenges into solutions you deliver. Real challenges with real solutions. And that's the thing that really um, has pi like pushed forward all of our programs. We've transformed those into intelligence by design and design for diversity. And we do program management to change you know, systems around us human by human. And that's what gets me up in the morning to do this. I think the stand is so great. Um... I think I think as uh, I think for the speaker I think we do mention something. Uh, just I think you have to follow something what you're passionate about. So otherwise, you if you don't like it, you're gonna fail. And I think um, also the culture awareness is very important. So uh, I think last last year I had chat with some of the I think the skin product. I think I think she had experience uh, doing the trading between China and Australia for twenty six years. Twenty six years. I think she's so great and she taught me. So you have to fully understand what's that uh, co um, country's um, local custom. So what they need. So and have, the brandings will be different. So you can't do all the same. So like, uh, because everyone has the, so I think everyone has, each country have their own culture. So you have to know what their culture is. So um, that's the reason why. So uh, some of the product from Australia to China, so they will translate into Chinese so people have a better understanding of what this product is about. People will feel, oh, this is very convenient too. So I think they have to really understand what the culture is for this country. And I think um, uh, you can take any idea and uh, customer, uh, cu customize it um, to the times. I think especially at least during this COVID, so everyone, most people are stuck at home. So as we said before, you have more time to share your idea and demonstrate your ideas to other people around you because people have more time when they start at home. So maybe you can start in like, I think as internet, so international students. So you might start with some um, business as a co-founder if you don't have too much experience. So you don't have to be a founder, so you can co-found with them and help them, learn with them <clears> and uh, share the idea with them, interact with them and meet more people. So you get more ideas. I think that's, from my perspective, I think you know how to get your idea and concept for business as an entrepreneur. I think uh, next, I think we have a few questions. Uh, can, I just, yep. can I just add, sorry, just one thing that you said there really stood out to me, which was, um, and I probably didn't explain to you clearly, part of the reason why I didn't go and create my own initiative is because this is the initiative that needed to happen. Yep. The other thing is I want to wave at the elephant in the room. We're three white folk who work with international students and you talked about translating as far as like text-based translating but one thing that tim shona and i do um is that we are really able and quite competent at cultural translation 
And what I mean by that is like when I went and did development work and lived in a rural community north of Yogyakarta, I arrived thinking I would go from Bahasa to English. They didn't speak Bahasa, they spoke Javanese. They didn't speak the Javanese I spoke. And so it went from, okay, how do we get grassroots projects off the ground when we can't even speak to each other? And it was through building cultural empathy with people like myself. I'm from the West Coast of the US. I grew up in a Hispanic community. So I grew up as a, as a minority where I was born. And then I, was, then I migrated and I was again a minority. I might look like a lot of Australians and a lot of people in Brunswick, but I actually had a lot of my childhood translating my experiences into local context. And I did that again when I was one of the only, only two people I went to school with um, who actually went to university and finished their degree and didn't drop out after the first 12 months. Something like 36% of rural, remote and regional Australians don't get past their first year. You know, we have, we have enormous issues like that. And so learning through my own lived experience and how to translate what is really going on. Yeah, absolutely, Jin Jin. Um, Jin Yi. Um, it is a really big issue in Australia. So yeah. building that cultural empathy is a big part of, I think, a, a bit of a wraparound for why we're here, but why we're doing what we do and something that you guys can develop in Australia by jumping in two feet first, you can develop that cultural empathy, which allows you to not just go between nations, because my story, I also mentioned between contexts. So going from not university educated to university educated. And even I went from doing my Bachelor of Arts at Monash with research at the end. Um, oh, I'm glad I got that right. Um, so I went from like a research background to a diploma of youth work, which is hands-on. And it was me dealing with alcohol and other drug affected young people um, and learning how to translate my culture into that context. And, and so I think, I think Sam, you, um, you raise a really good point there that um, we, we are really mindful of what we represent visually. Um, and we have hugely, as we know each other quite well, we have quite diverse backgrounds. We understand what it means to work uh, through many challenges and um, and in many communities um, and I think that what you talk about with culture raises a really interesting point about a question that was presented around failure and Tim doesn't know this but I'm going to hand this to him in a minute because failure is a really interesting subject particularly in our uh, white startup community and I'm going to say that I'm going to put it out there because we treat failure as success okay now that's because it's culturally appropriate for us to say we learn from our mistakes we put it out there we tell everyone about it we share it and we have our communities around us that can protect us and nurture us and carry us forward as you say Sam fa failing forward um, that that presents itself quite um, in a challenging light if you're from a culturally diverse background where failure may not be seen in the same light um, and then on top of that you're in a completely a foreign country where you don't necessarily have all the supports around you um, and and so I want to talk a little bit about that in terms of the cultural context and I'm going to hand it to, to Tim um, to, to talk a little bit about what that means because what failure means to me may mean something completely different from somebody from South Asia compared to somebody from um, a country in Africa or a country in Europe or somebody from Los Angeles who'll probably jump on a couch and say this is fabulous. Tim, would you like to add to my cultural... Sure, so uh, Junji, we're, we're going right into Q&A here. You're okay with that? Yes, we're going to Q&A. Uh, yeah. All right, so I'm going to be really quick because I'm conscious yep. of time. Um, and thank you, Carol, for your uh, great uh, questions, because um, I think it's mainly coming from Carol. Um, my advice is what you're asking is well recognized. And there's a lot of jargon around it saying fail fast, fail forward. It's okay to fail, uh, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, if, if you're failing and taking a lot of money with you of your own, then that's kind of problematic, particularly if you're struggling to look for employment. Um, my advice is to use the system. Um, and the system we use here stems out of America, and that creates a problem, no offense, Sam. Um, but some of the aspects of the system are really useful, where you actually give yourself time fences. So for example, the idea is, you have an idea, you want to start a business, but the first thing you do is 
incubate your idea. So you don't start a business, you actually check out your idea and there's a whole bunch of processes where you come out with something called an MVP or a minimal viable product. And it really means, is my product good? Do I have competitive advantage? And will somebody pay for it? The question you're answering is, do I have a business? Um, and if the answer is no, then don't do anything. Go back to the drawing board. Or the word they use is pivot and say, can I change it so that it is a business? The next stage is acceleration where you need to say, well, all right, what do we need to turn it into a team? Who do I need to employ? Who do I build my thing? How do I deliver it? Do I, you know, and you know, when you see startup businesses, you know, who's in your company? I've got four biomedical engineers. Well, do you have someone from marketing? No, finance, no, legal, no. Um, you're going to fail. So that process is about building a capable team that are passionate and can deliver the business. So um, what you're doing is de-risking your chances of failure by jumping all in. You're doing it step by step to see if each step that you still have a business. Do I still have a business? So you need to maintain your enthusiasm. Um, and I think the other question is during that process, I think Carol, you'd asked about money. <laughs> there is no answer to your question about getting seed funding, but you can improve the chances of getting seed funding by doing a couple of things. So learn how to communicate your idea to people and the classic modern way of doing that is to pitch. So once again, you're lucky um, in that there's a bunch of groups and I think Shona might've put up Silicon Beach, for example. I recently pitched just for the fun of it, 90 second pitch about the GLOW project. Our whole idea and how valuable it is to join students and businesses in one and a half minutes and the, you get to stop, no more. Um, so going through that process is one of the really good ways of having somebody in your team learn how to communicate your value proposition to gain support both from a community standpoint, but also from somebody with money. So um, I'll leave it there. I didn't really delve into the cultural sides of that, Shona, but um, okay. you know, I think that's more, that's more of a practical step-by-step -step guide. Um, and I think Shona also pointed to LaunchPick. There's lots of resources and support on how you can get people to, to help you fund and provide advice, uh, mentorship in that space. I think, I think really just to add to that, Tim, that um, thank you, because that, that's, that's exactly what um, everybody participating can consider. But I think in failure, it's really to put it into context of what that means for you as a person and what you need as support, um, because failure can be a really um, a good learning, but you need to make sure that you're ready for that in your own, um, in your own way. Yeah, and it comes back to what I sort of said earlier when I did first mention Val Forward, is you do need to know, like, why you're failing. Like, you know, and, like, building a community around you can make a softer landing. Um, and also, like, it, you're only, you're, it's a total failure if you learn nothing. Um, but it can also be a pretty... If, you, if you've checked in with yourself and you've inspected the situation ahead of you and you're like, I want to do this in a bit of thing, and you said, well, some of the challenges is the amount of money that I actually can afford to put on the line. Be real, be, on, be honest, be vulnerable with yourself as much as you should be with others. Because um, the, 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 the mantra that I popped in the chat is actually share, don't sell. So like a pitch is not always to actually sell. And particularly if you're out there exploring your opportunities, you might be sharing what you're passionate about and what you want to change in the world. And people go, oh, yeah, you should go to this. I know this really cool program. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's like called Glow, Glow Project or something. Like, I don't know. I saw them and they're amazing. And Tim and Sean are really smart and know stuff. Or you might hear about like Usman Iftika and his Catalyzer program. Or, you know, people will get to know you and get to support you. Because the other thing to point out is Tim, Sean and I already know each other. Like, the community is cute and lovely and willing to support, like, you know, you don't have to just go with people you met on a call. You can actually reach out to people, you know, and it's not because they're hashtag hustlers. It's because we actually care about the community growing. We don't, we don't just buy into Startup Victoria as making it the best, you know, startup ecosystem, which is great. But, you know, it's the most welcoming, one of the most welcoming city in the world for students. And it's the same for new businesses. And I think that what you raise, Sam, is really important because, um, you know, not to keep plugging what we do, but um, it's really invaluable that 
you can reach out to communities where you've come to Australia for a reason. One of those reasons clearly must be to learn English and to communicate in, another, in that other language. The best place to do that is with other students who want to do the same. Um, and so going to places where you're going to have to speak English with others and practice your craft with others, you can do that in two ways. You can go to these startup nights and every Australian will be very patient and, um, and work with you to do that. And they are incredibly um, inspiring nights to watch what some of those startup uh, founders go through. And the other is to join communities that are similar to you, where you're with other students who have similar levels of, of English um, and you can work together on that. So that's why we create these um, communities for students. And, Thank and, you. and don't get too and don't get too upset about there not being like a local opportunity every, or that you can't go physically to these things. It's been my favorite, my number one favorite thing about COVID-19, and it's a terrible and tough and awful time. But one really, really great thing has simply been you're not geo, you're not postcode locked. You can go wherever you want in the world and sign on to a session. If you're passionate, you'll get up at 2 a.m. for a Silicon Valley event, you know? So don't be afraid to be the only Aussie in the room or the only person in this time zone there. Don't worry about that. Give it a go. Oh. Uh, Jun Yi, can I, can I have a go at answering one of the other questions? I think Julieta, yeah. very briefly. Make um, yes, I was going to ask you to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so Julieta, uh, you're, in, you're in the best city in the world to answer that question. Um, so biomedical engineering is unusual in research because in Australia we have a culture of research and publish. What you want to do is research, deliver to where it makes impact, get it into use. Um, biomedical engineering, it's more common that you approach it than astrophysics, which is tends to be published. Um, so at any given time, you can go to events all over the um, city where there's people talking and I'll point you to a company called Stelec, S-T-E-L-E-C-T, -E -E and a young lady called, uh, called um, Elise Sutherland, who is doing exactly what you're asking, um, biomedical scientist, delivering a product, um, cardiac care in their case. Um, there's a number of four or five com companies I could name where the engineers themselves are taking their product to a startup business, they're building a team who aren't just biomedical engineers, um, go and watch them at events and go and speak to them. They're very generous with their time and ask them um, about how they manage their journey. So um, that would be um, my advice to you, Julieta. But have, you know, after this event, reach out and we can have more discussions if you wish. Yeah. Thanks team. I think, sorry everyone, because of the lack of time, we'll have to wrap it up. I think about, Feel free to reach out to them with the QR code. So scan them. So I think check the Marco Polo project and uh, I was participating to the Start Global before we so great project. So feel free to check it. So you need a QR code, scan it so you can jump into the web website. And uh, uh, we have a next session uh, at one o'clock um, social session. Um, please register on the, our conference page. And uh, um, and I think Junyi Raphael is going to put up maybe yes. our social media QR codes as well if people are interested in. Um, so you can get it through our event, our, our website, but the event um, uh, QR codes, there they are. Yep, there, I think. there they are. Oh, there it is. There they are. There. Um, so people um, can scan those and there are our events coming up. Yep. Yeah, we're going to be having some Facebook Lives to help um, answer some of the questions that we weren't able to answer today. And so what I'd highly recommend is they post their questions to us and we can help continue this conversation over the next few weeks so that we can see some great businesses built during lockdown. Yep. Thanks, Janet. Yeah. And uh, I think um, uh, we have people from Inside Guys Ross. Would you like to play the video, Michael's video? So uh, we are ready for the next uh, social session. Here we are. Here we are. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael. I was privileged to be selected as the best volunteer of CISA this year. Thank you for joining us for today's session. And I'd like to jump on here to invite you of our social session happening today at 1 p.m. Focused on volunteers today, leaders of tomorrow. Join us in a fun and interactive session. Don't forget to register on the link in the conference page, or you can find the link in your Zoom chat box. See you there. Thank you.
the yeah, team Sam Shanna feel free to jump in that section so to hear more people's idea you might get a new idea so I think thank you for coming today so feel free to reach out to team Sam and Shanna and feel free to reach out to me Jun Yi as well so if you have any question um, thank you for attending today and be safe take care of yourself never stop learning Mm. learning sharing that's what you learned today so <laughs> thank you for coming everyone thank you so much team and sam and shona thank you everyone thank, thank you. you you're welcome my pleasure thank you team <laughs>